Hi, my name is Pavel, and this is my colleague Georgi. Uh, I'm a research expert at SCP Labs Bulgaria. I've been doing this for more than 10 years. We do applied research and try to apply all those innovations in the SCP products. And my colleague Georgi is, uh, is a developer who did a fellowship in my team working on the topic of uh, satellite Earth observation, which is uh, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so first of all, maybe you don't know, but the European Space Agency has launched a number of satellites circling around the Earth and doing observation 24-7. Uh, it started around 2014, and as of today, we have uh, like seven different missions equipped with different instruments that are looking for different things on the Earth's surface. And we're going to focus on Sentinel-2, which is specialized in uh, Earth observation in the visible and infrared spectrum. So more or less, it does something like uh, pictures. It circles the Earth. It's two satellites that circle around the Earth in this uh, uh, strange orbit that you see on the right-hand side of the, of the slide. And uh, they provide global coverage every five days, which means that uh, you see new images of the Earth, of every place on the Earth every five days. And uh, the data access to, this, to those images is uh, free of charge. You can download them. You don't have to pay anything. All you have to do is create an account on a website that I'll show in, in the moment. There's tens of terabytes of data produced every day, and already around tens of petabytes of data accumulated. And uh, there's also some commercial offerings that try to make life easier, but we're mostly going to focus on the free and open data access in this presentation. And uh, before I show you a little demo, uh, let me explain what's in the data. The instrument that's on the satellite, it's something like a camera, but not quite, because it has more bands, actually 13 bands. And it also sees in the infrared spectrum. And each image that you get from the satellite is uh, around 100 by 100 kilometers. And those bands have different resolution, ranging from 10, 20, and 60 meters per pixel. So it's not quite the details that you see on, on Google Maps, but still quite useful for use cases like uh, ecology, climate change, uh, digital farming, and so on. And all this complexity is packaged in, in image format called JPEG 2000, which not only supports multiple bands, but also lets you embed geospatial information so that you can correctly reproject those images on a map. And uh, now it's time for our first demo. It's uh, how you can download data manually uh, from the European Space Agency website and visualize the data in an open source program called QGIS. Uh, what you see on the map is the website of Copernicus. You just have to go to the, to the location that you're interested in and then select the area of interest. Once you do that, you can specify additional search criteria like uh, the ingestion period in which you're interested and also the mission and the product type. We're selecting here the bottom of the atmosphere images which have had some correction applied. And uh, then you just select the product from the list of products and start the download. It's quite a big file, about one gigabyte, and once it is uh, downloaded and unpacked on the file system, inside you can see uh, folders, and one of these folders contains the, the actual band data. Uh, and uh, we're interested in the 10 meter resolution bands right now. And, uh, what I'll show you here is the so-called true color image, which is some sort of a synthetic image of some bands combined. Uh, in QGIS, we add an open street map layer so we can get ourselves around on the map. And then we just open this uh, file that I showed you, the so-called true color image. And as a result, we should see something on the map. And there it is, this uh, teeny mini image down there. And if I zoom in, we can see that it's actually something that looks like a picture and it's correctly reprojected on the map that, uh, and overlaps with uh, our city. However, if we look closer on the image, we can see that the, what they call true color is not so true because it, is, it doesn't correspond very well to what you would see if you get on an airplane and observe the Earth from the same uh, area. And the reason for this uh, is uh, 
something that my colleague is going to explain on the next slides. Thank you. Uh, the problem here comes from the difference of the color matching uh, functions of the satellite camera and the uh, human eye. In the top image, uh, you can see the uh, functions that the uh, satellite uses to convert the uh, spectral reflectance to its own uh, color space, Sentinel-2. And underneath, uh, you can see the functions that the human eye uses to get color out of spectral reflectance. Um, the main difference, as you can see, is that uh, the human eye has only three bands, which are the popular red, green, and blue. And uh, the satellite camera has 13 bands, which, uh, some of which are in the infrared spectrum. Uh, now let's focus on the three selected bands in the top image. Uh, we are skipping the first one because uh, the image that comes for that band uh, has 60 by 60 meter resolution, which is too rough for our purposes. And uh, now if you look at the direction of the arrows, you can see that the direct mapping between those three bands to the um, human eye functions is uh, not so accurate here. Um, Sentinel-2 uses just this type of mapping to produce their uh, true color images, which Pavel showed. And, um, but can we do better? Uh, indeed, uh, we can get a better color estimation by um, trying to solve the following problem. Uh, the only data that we have is the satellite image, which contains the Sentinel responses. Uh, the full spectra is currently unknown. And uh, we are trying to find a mapping to XYZ color space, which represents uh, human vision. Um, uh, one approach that you might think of is uh, if we can try to reconstruct the full spectra from the f uh, Sentinel responses. But this task is uh, really hard because uh, Sentinel responses are only three or four numbers in the visible spectrum, while a full spectra is represented by 400 numbers. Uh, so we should attack the problem from a different angle. Uh, if we have the full spectra, then we can calculate the Sentinel-2 responses. And uh, also we can calculate the XYZ responses. And now by having these two data sets, we, uh, the problem is reduced to finding the best mapping between them. Uh, but where do we get the common full spectra data set? Fortunately, NASA has created the Ecostress Spectral Library, which contains uh, more than 3,000 uh, popular natural and man-made materials, which can be found on the Earth's surface. Uh, around uh, 2,000 of those materials uh, contain data in the visible spectrum, which we are interested in. Uh, in the left image, you can see uh, the data uh, from a single example of this library. Over the x-axis, we have the wavelength in uh, micrometers, and over the y-axis, we have the reflectance in percentage. Uh, on the right, you can see the data zoomed in only in the visible spectrum. Um, and from that image, you can get a hint that the color is more likely to be uh, brown than blue. But to get the exact color estimation, we need a way to apply the X, Y, Z color matching functions from previous slides. And here comes the Color Science Library, which is a free open source BSD license uh, Python library, uh, which contains many algorithms and uh, data sets in the color science field. Uh, on the right, you can see uh, the representation of the library as a graph. Uh, for our purposes, we will use uh, the path from spectral distribution to XYZ color space, which is one of the most important uh, color spaces on this image, because it can uh, represent all visible colors to the human eye. Uh, but unfortunately, that color space is not so suitable for displaying on computer screens. Uh, so we need to convert it uh, to sRGB because of the limited color capabilities of computer monitors. And now that we have this nice library, we can proceed to the first step of the natural color estimation, uh, which is generating the XYZ data set. Uh, you can see on the top uh, uh, a single example of this EcoStress library. Underneath, uh, there are the XYZ color matching functions. And by using a simple one-liner from the Python library, we can get the XYZ responses. And repeating this task for all the uh, examples in the data set, uh, we can generate the first data set that we need. Then we should do something similar uh, for the Sentinel-2 responses, and uh, we use the uh, spectral response functions of the satellite. Um, unfortunately, this wasn't implemented in the color science library. 
so we had to do it ourselves. And uh, now that we have the two data sets, uh, this is a common machine learning problem, uh, and we need to find the best mapping between them. Uh, the biggest challenge here was uh, that we do not have lots of data, because we have only 2,000 examples. And uh, so we had to implement a very small neural network. Uh, yeah, and uh, the, this gave us quite good results, which are shown on the next slide. On the left, this is uh, the example from the X-Stress library, some kind of soil displayed uh, in sRGB, so we can show it on the screen. This is what you should see. In the middle, this is uh, the XYZ responses uh, that correspond to the true color image conversion that Sentinel-2 uses. And on the right is the result from our approach with the neural network, which uh, seems pretty close to what you should see. But wouldn't it be nice if we can explore the data uh, in the browser? For this task, we have created a simple POC system uh, that can display natural color images for a given date range. And I will show you now. Um, this is a map implemented with the help of the open source JavaScript library leaflet. Uh, we have chosen the OpenStreetMap as a base layer, and we have selected the date range to be from 10th of January until 20th of January. And uh, now we enable the Sentinel-2 layer. Implementing this layer required the use of quite a few algorithms from the open source uh, library GDAO. Uh, for example, cutting the images to the shape of Bulgaria, um, uh, reprojecting the coordinate reference system and generating smaller tiles. Now let's zoom in uh, so we can see some farm fields better. Um, let's go to the small town of General Toshevo, which is my village, and see what has been going on there. As Sentinel-2 provides an image every five days, we should be able to see some difference if we go back in time. And yeah, as we can see. Um, this map can be a good uh, entry point for a more complex system that contains other useful features like uh, monitoring uh, land temperature, um, crop yield, or other things that farmers may use. But what are the key takeaways of this presentation? There is free satellite data available out there just waiting for you. Uh, there are also lots of open source tools that you can use. And last but not least, there are many use cases where satellite images can be applied, uh, for example, in digital farming, as we already showed. And uh, in ecology, you can, for example, monitor uh, pollution, deforestation, drought, etc. And yeah, we encourage you to try it out. Thank you very much for the attention. We'll be happy to answer your questions now or after the presentation. <laughs> I know it was quite of a complex topic, but st still, if you have some questions, even if you think they, they may be stupid questions, don't be afraid to ask. There's no stupid question. Every question is valid. So you're, you're working with SAP, right? Yeah, we both work for SAP, and we're focused on digital farming. So what, why is this project related to SAP? This is my question. Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear very well. How is this project related to SAP's It is product? related because of digital farming. It's a new area that's emerging right now. There is a lot of investment. And one of the major use cases is digital farming, where farmers would like to observe their land. Of course, we only showed you the visual part of the, of the images, but there's also infrared and also other satellites that can give you information like wind speed, surface temperature, and so on. And when you combine all of this data, it can be an indispensable tool for the farmer and for the people who operate a lot of land. There's, of course, other use cases as well, like uh, for climate purposes, for disaster management, for deforestation monitoring. Uh, another very prominent use case that comes to mind is for controlling the give out of uh, subs subsidies uh, in, uh, in India, for example, where people are incentivized not based on the, the plot size, but based on the yield. And they currently apply very complex methodology to estimate the, the yield and the harvest. And uh, this technology has a lot of uses. One of these is, of course, to uh, reduce the level of corruption in those government payments.